Our text this morning is John's Gospel, chapter 8, and verses 44 to 47. John 8, 44 to 47. The Apostle writes, You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason you do not hear them, because you are not of God. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, you might have noticed, if you were paying attention two weeks ago, that this section in John 8, 44 to 47, we actually covered at the end of the last sermon that I gave on John's Gospel, chapter 8. And I wanted to cover it again this week because it's really crucial for us to understand exactly who the devil is and how he works in the world. He is the great deceiver. He keeps people enslaved to him through lies. He lied to Eve at the very beginning, saying to her that if she ate from the tree which God commanded her not to eat from, she would not surely die. He directly contradicts what God said, the clear and explicit warning of God. And as soon as our first parents listened to the words of the devil, Instead of to God, both they and their progeny, which is us by nature, ever after we became willing slaves of both sin and the devil. This is true of all men by nature to this very day. Revelation 12, 12 9 uh, tells us, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. That's what Revelation calls him, the deceiver of the whole world. So that when someone says something like, well, can one billion or two billion Muslims be wrong? The answer to that is, well, of course. The devil is the deceiver of the whole world. And Jesus refers to this casting down of Satan in Luke 10.18. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And ever since that time, the devil and his angels have ever been at work in the sons of disobedience. That's what Paul writes about him. That he is the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that is now at work. Now at work in the sons of disobedience. But how is he at work? Paul calls the devil the prince of the power of the air. This spirit that now works. In Hollywood and majority of charismatics would have you believe that the primary way in which Satan acts is through bizarre manifestations of creepy bloodshot eyes and spinning heads. But the reality is actually far more sinister. The same Apostle John who wrote this gospel says in his first epistle, we know that we are the children of God, and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. That's 1 John 5, 19. The whole world 
is under the control of the evil one. How, though? Because he lies. The whole world believes the devil's lies. It isn't just those who look like devils either who are under the devil's power. Although that is what he wants you to think. He wants you to think that only people who, I don't know, wear really dark black mascara and have, you know, spiky hair, that, that those are like the bad people. And everyone else who kind of, whatever, puts on a tie and dresses nice, like those are the good people. Right? He wants us to think that. That's what he wants. But the entire world system is under his power. He disguises himself as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. He teaches his children to do his desires through lying teachers in the education system who lie to children, telling them that they are nothing more than highly developed monkeys. That's all they are, a monkey with a more developed cerebrum. And if you tell that to children, they're going to believe it. And if they believe that they're animals, what do you think they're going to act like? Yeah, that's exactly right. They're going to act like animals. He lies through psychologists who tell their clients that their problems are based on how they were raised or their past traumas. And as I've mentioned before, I'm not saying that it's not possible for a person to be traumatized. Of course, of course, people are traumatized. And it's awful when that happens, of course. But our fundamental and primary identity is not as a victim. That's not what the Bible says about us. The Bible does not say that I'm a victim of how I was raised. I'm a victim of my dad who wasn't nice sometimes, or I'm a victim of my mom, or maybe some didn't have a dad or didn't have a mom, and then, well, I'm a victim now because of that. But that's not what the scripture says. You cannot stand before the Lord Jesus on the final day and say, well, the reason that I lived a totally, completely godless life, I didn't want to love you or follow you or serve you in any way, is because I, my mom and dad treated me badly? Like, that's not going to be an excuse that Jesus is going to take on the final day. All right? We're responsible for ourselves. For ourselves. No matter what kind of really terrible and horrible thing happens to us. And, and sometimes there really are horrible situations. But we're responsible ultimately for our own decisions. For our own actions. For our own obedience or lack thereof. Our own obedience to the... Sinful desire. We have to take responsibility for that. He lies through scientists who write articles denying that creation has a creator. He lies through the empty promises of politicians. He lies through the promotion of false gender ideology. He lies through social media. He lies through mainstream media. He lies through every man. The devil is the father of lies. He's the father of lies. Let God be true and every man a liar. And he works in every natural man, every single one. When the text says that the devil was a murderer from the beginning, it says that because that is ultimately his desire. Satan's desire is to murder you. That's why those, those people who like, there's like the, the, the Satan temple. You see them on the news sometimes. There's like a goat. A, their symbol is like some d weird goat creature that's like sitting on a bench with its hand open and its hand, hand is out. And they like worship this thing or many of them would call themselves atheists. But, but they like worship the devil. That's like the dumbest thing in the whole world. The devil wants to kill all of us. He wants all of us to... Be destroyed forever. He hates you. He wants to kill you. He cannot murder God. And so he wants to murder us. This is a fundamental thing which all of us need to grasp. That we actually have a real enemy in the world. When somebody says, even a well-meaning Christian says, You know, I, 
everybody loves me and I love everybody. I have no enemies at all. It's actually not such a great sign if a person says that. Jesus said that the world would hate us if we follow him. He said that. So if no one in the world ever hates you, maybe it's because you're not actually acting out what the gospel says you are to do. Maybe that's actually the reason. Maybe the reason is because you're not speaking the truth. Because the world believes a lie. Since the world believes a lie, it cannot recognize the truth and it hates the truth. It hides in the darkness because it has fear that the light of the truth is going to expose it. That's what Jesus says in John chapter 3. He says that those who do not believe, they hide in the darkness. They have fear of the light, that their deeds will be exposed through it. Hmm. And since the devil cannot murder God, he wants to murder us. And the best and most effective way for him to do that is through lies. It was a lie that the serpent told Eve, you will not surely die. When she ate of that tree that God commanded her not to eat from, God told Adam, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Satan lied and denied that fact. When man listened to the lie, he died which is exactly what the serpent wanted to happen. So when Jesus says that Satan was a murderer from the beginning, that's what he's talking about. He knew, he knew that Eve was going to die when she ate of the tree. He knew that Adam was going to die. That's why he tried to get them to do it. That's why he poisoned their minds. When man listened to the lie, he died. This is why Peter tells us, in his first epistle, that we are to be sober and alert because we have an adversary who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The word in Greek, therefore, opponent, is like an evil lawyer in a courtroom who will do anything to utterly destroy us. And this fact cannot be overlooked. That there is someone in the universe who is looking to do us harm. He's not our friend. He's our adversary. And he wants our complete annihilation. And our adversary is an extremely powerful one. Who is our adversary? Our adversary is the devil. The word devil means slanderer. Someone who lies. The devil is a slanderer. He's the arch enemy of man's spiritual interest. I'd like to take a brief look at a couple of passages with you that describe who it is that this is talking about. Who is our enemy? Perhaps we've looked at them before, but it bears looking at again. If you turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 28... Keep your finger here in John. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 28, starting at verse 11. Listen to what the prophet Ezekiel writes. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, you had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Let me just pause right there. Isn't that interesting? Because there's a place, it's in the north of Israel, called Tyre, T-Y-R-E. And this starts out, right, and say to the king of Tyre. The king of Tyre was a, a human, a person. But then... It's talking about this person as though they were in Eden. It says you were in Eden, the garden of God. So what is going on here? It's that the king of Tyre during the time of Ezekiel was actually possessed by some entity. And it is that entity, i.e. Satan himself, to whom Ezekiel is referring here. He's referring to the devil. Listen to what he says about the devil. Take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. 
Every precious stone was your covering. The ruby, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl and the onyx, and the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise and the emerald, and the gold, and the workmanship of your settings and sockets. Anybody else have a different translation there? Anybody have King James Version? You know what it says in the King James Version? It says the, the workmanship of your pipes and timbrels. Isn't that interesting? Your pipes and your timbrels. Those are musical instruments. There are some historic commentators who believe that what this is referring to is that Satan, the devil, before he became the devil, that he had some sort of musical instruments as a part of himself, like an organ, pipes and timbrels, like a pipe organ. Actually, I pointed at the pipe organ. I, when I first came here, I thought that that was real, man. But, <laughs> but it's actually not. It's made out of wood. It looks so real to me. <clears throat> his pipes and his timbrels, that, that, that this is where the idea comes from. Anyway, perhaps you've heard it before that Satan was like the choir master of heaven. He's leading music, which there's a whole other rabbit trail one could go down in the way that, that the devil infiltrates and uses music to, toward his ends, for sure. So your pipes and your timbrels was in you on the day that you were created. They were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers he was anointed. He's chosen. He's a cherub. What's it, where else do we see cherub? Uh, when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, God placed a cherub and a flaming sword to guard the way to the tree of life. A cherub is a sort of a type of angel. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day that you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence, and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as, a prof as profane from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. So why, though? Look at verse 17. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. So he sees how beautiful he is, vanity. He looks at his own beauty. His heart was lifted up by his beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. And by the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore, I brought fire from the midst of you. It has consumed you. And I have turned you to ashes on the, on the earth in, all, in the eyes of all who look and see you. All right. So we see here the context of Ezekiel 28 that this person about whom the Lord is saying these things, he saw his beauty, he corrupted his wisdom by reason of his splendor. So he saw his splendor and he became unwise. How did he become unwise? We see how in Isaiah chapter 14. Turn back up. Just two more books to Isaiah 14, and we see exactly how he corrupted his wisdom, Satan. Isaiah 14, uh, verses 12 and onward. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, O Lucifer, in another translation, Star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart. Now we're going to see how he corrupted his wisdom for the sake of his splendor. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit 
on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. So, I mean, that, that's it, isn't it? That's the very thing that he was cast down for. That's why Satan was cast out of heaven, was because he said, I'm going to set my throne above God's throne. I'm going to be God now. And God cast him down out of heaven as a profane thing. That's also the exact temptation with which he tempted Eve, isn't it? Take of the tree, eat it. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, you will be like him. You will be like him. That's what he said. That's what he wanted. He wanted to be like God. He wanted to be God. And since he could not be God, and God judged him and cast him down out of heaven, he tempted Eve to try that same trick. To eat from the tree. God knows if you eat of it, you'll be like him. And she thinks, yes, it's good. I want to be that. And she eats, and she also dies, and Adam dies. Nevertheless, you'll be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you. They will ponder over you saying, now this is in the future. They will ponder over you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble? Who shook kingdoms? Who made the world like a wilderness and overthrew its cities? Who did not allow his prisoners to go home? That's what, that's what the saints are going to say when they see the ultimate destruction of Satan in hell. I want to show you just one more place, one more place way at the end of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 12. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 12, starting at verse 7. And there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. That is our adversary. That is our adversary. John calls him a great dragon. Moses calls him a serpent. Jesus calls him a strong man. Paul says that for all of that, he disguises himself as an angel of light. The imagery alone of these things should be terrifying, especially because Satan's true nature is disguised to us, to us by nature. Satan's true nature is disguised to man by nature. It is only through the revelation of the scriptures that we can see the truth and see how the devil actually twists it and lies. Ezekiel tells us that the devil was way back there all the way in Eden as a cherub. Isaiah tells us what happened. He was seduced by his own vanity and he fell to the earth from heaven. And Jesus says in Luke 10, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Friends, we must not make any mistake about this. Our adversary is a mighty adversary. We must not underestimate him. Were it left up to us in our own strength to fight against him, we would lose every time because he has certain advantages over us. He's smarter than the natural man, for one thing. He's smarter. He's more crafty. He's lived for thousands of years. He understands human nature. He understands our temptations. He's invisible. He can easily ensnare us. His main goal over the last 6,000 years has been to oppose Christ and Christ's people through lies and manipulation. And he wants nothing more than to see all of us turn from the truth and to be destroyed. The great Puritan Thomas Brooks wrote this, Beloved, Satan being fallen from light to darkness, from felicity to misery, from heaven to hell, from an angel to a devil, is so full of malice and envy that he will leave no means unattempted, whereby he may make all others as eternally miserable as he himself is. 
That's it. Now let's look at our text. Why do you not believe me? Jesus says. Look at verse 42 or 44. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And he's a liar because he wants to devour us. Bible tells us he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. This imagery of a hungry lion seeks to convey strength and fury. I'm immediately reminded of those wicked men who had maliciously accused Daniel before King Darius and the fate that they met when they and their families were themselves thrown into the lion's den. Daniel 6.24 says, The king then gave orders, and they cast them, their children, and their wives into the lion's den. And they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. That is how vicious a hungry lion is. Mm, uh, a man by nature, again I say by nature, outside of the, the protecting and overpowering influence of the Holy Spirit. Man by nature is a snack for a lion. He's a snack for the devil. That's it. That's why we have to be of sober spirit, on the alert, because that's what the devil is. Yet, even though he's a roaring lion, we are not called to wave the white flag. The Bible does not say, your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, therefore, all hope is lost. No, he says, resist him. Stand firm in your faith. Really? We can resist a lion? We can resist the ancient serpent, the devil? Yes, not in our own strength, but in the strength of Jesus Christ. We're called to stand on the truth of the gospel. Not to hide our light in fear, but rather to put it on a lampstand. And though that will attract the lion, though that will attract this vicious person who wants to devour us, we have an even stronger lion, don't we? The lion of the tribe of Judah. And he will fight for us. He will fight for us. It doesn't mean that we'll be exempt from suffering in this world. We need to expect that. Just as so many other brethren um, do indeed suffer terrible trials throughout the world. Terrible things. Remember when ISIS was going around to houses in Mosul and Syria and different places and, and putting this letter N on the house of every Christian so that they knew which houses were that Christians lived in and they, they either had to confess uh, to be Muslims or else watch their children be burned or beheaded or some other horrible fate. You remember when, when that happened? Mm. There are lots of Christians on Facebook like putting the N on, uh, on their Facebook profile. Which is fine. But it's easy, though, to do that when you're living here, right? It is easy. It's easy to do that. I stand, I stand with those Christians. I stand with those. And I do. I, I do. It's amazing. It's, it's amazing the stand that so many of them took for the faith in the face of the most awful kinds of death imaginable. Um, I, I can only hope that if a similar thing ever happened here that I would stand. I couldn't do it in my flesh, but with God's help, you know, with, only with God's help. Um, and so, so standing up against the roaring lion doesn't mean that we're not going to have trouble from him or suffer. That's a message that... Uh, is, is not the gospel. That so-called health and wealth prosperity nonsense is not the Christian message. It's absolutely not. Absolutely not. 
The Christian message is one which can be preached everywhere to all people. You could not go into Mosul, Iraq during the time of ISIS persecution and say to them, friend, don't you know God just wants you to be happy right now? <laughs> you, you couldn't do that. That's not a, they would say, what are you talking about? Like, be happy. Like, we're dying, man. We're dying. No, no, that's because it's not Christianity what those people preach, what, what those prosperity preachers preach. It's not Christianity. It's not the message of the cross. The message of the cross is that we may, in fact, die for Christ. We may. But regardless of whether we do or not, Christ died for us. And because he died for us, my soul is secure with him, whether in life or in death. And all of the Christian suffering in this world is temporary. It is only for a little while. And afterward, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, and strengthen, and establish you. Look at these promises. He's promised to protect us, or to perfect us, I mean. Here we wrestle with sin and failure and wretchedness. Sometimes we even listen to the voice of the evil one, but someday the Lord will make our souls and bodies perfect. No more sin, no more sorrow, no more indwelling effects of the curse. We will be restored to a perfect state. And we will be confirmed. Another translation puts it secure. We'll be secure. No more will anyone be tossed about or unsure. No more will we, will we be anxious about anything because God will secure his people forever. We will be strengthened. How great is that promise that we will be strengthened, that your body will be strengthened, um, both physically and spiritually. God has promised to make our soul and body strong. And finally, we will be established. The Greek word there is thamelios. It means foundation. We'll have a sure and solid foundation that cannot be shaken because death shall be no more and we will abide forever with the Lord. I know that was kind of a long caveat, kind of side, side note about who the devil is. But it's important for us to know um, that we have an enemy, that he's very, very good at deceiving us. That Jesus says about these people who many of them, I mean, they're in the temple, right? They're... They think that they're serving God. They think that they belong to God. They think that they're God's people. And Jesus is saying to these people, as they're standing in God's temple, you are of your father, the devil. And the reason you don't believe me is because you're so used to the devil's lies that when you hear the truth, it sounds like a lie to you. That's what he's saying. That's what the text is saying. Look at what he says in verse 45 to 47. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why don't you believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason you do not hear them, because you are not of God. In the late 90s, the American president, Bill Clinton, was involved in a scandal with a White House intern. He denied ever having inappropriate relations with her until it was discovered beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was guilty. And when he asked why he lied, he said in a famous televised interview, it depends on what the meaning of the word is, is. That's what he said. It depends on what the meaning of the word is, is. I mean, talk about being slippery. <laughs> That's as slippery as it gets. His answer is so crafty. I wonder if it was not the serpent himself who was speaking through his servant. Jesus tells this crowd in the temple that the reason they do not believe him is because he speaks the truth. I'm reminded of another quote from history. Winston Churchill said, Men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing ever happened. And so here's a good definition. What is the truth? Well, truth is what is. Truth defines or describes reality. Or better yet, truth is reality. For sinful mortals like us, our reality is ever-changing. We age and we eventually die and become dust. 
That's why no one but Jesus could ever say, as we learned earlier in, in uh, uh, or as, as we were learning in John's gospel, only Jesus could say, could say um, I am the truth and have it really be so. Because as soon as anyone else says that, I am the truth, as soon as they say that, it becomes untrue because they're, they've changed. Their molecules inside change. Their person changes from one moment to another. We are different. But Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus said before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus is the eternal one, the son of man who comes on the clouds of heaven. Only he can say, I am the truth. He alone is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Jesus is the truth because his nature and constitution and promises and kingship and decrees Never change. They stand forever because he stands forever. When he says heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The reason he can say that is because he's alive. He ever lives. He stands forever. He's there to make all of his promises come true. And without question, friends, we live in the most ignorant and arrogant time in history regarding the truth of Jesus Christ. We think that man is so advanced, but this question of the nature of truth was asked 2,000 years ago. When Jesus was on trial before Pontius Pilate, he gave Pilate a way out of his predicament. The governor was questioning Jesus, saying, Are you a king? And Jesus answered it. He said, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. How postmodern of Pontius Pilate. Postmodern. What is truth? Is there any objective reality whatsoever to truth? Oh, how contemporary our Bible is. Surely his question is applicable in today's context where the notion of any absolute truth is scorned and ridiculed. Here is the personification of truth standing in front of Pontius Pilate, looking him right in the eyes, and Pilate is unfazed by it. After living a life of deception, the truth is really hard to recognize. And as Pilate had twisted and distorted the truth so many times in his political career, he could not recognize it if it stared him in the face. Here's Jesus, the one who so clearly says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's telling his inquisitor, if he wants to know what the truth is, he has to listen to the person who is standing right in front of him. But he would not do it. He said, what is truth? And then he wouldn't stay for an answer. He asked the question, but he asked the question rhetorically. Pilate asked this question rhetorically. He says, what is truth? He doesn't really want to know, though, does he? He doesn't. He doesn't stay. He leaves. One of the most famous prophecies in the Bible about who the Messiah would be is contained in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8 to 9. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation... Who considered that he was cut off for the, out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, though he had done no violence, and there was no deceit found in his mouth. Look at what Jesus says. He says, because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. There was no deceit found in his mouth. We fallen sinners cannot even imagine it. How often does deceit come flowing out from our lips on a daily basis? Hey, great job on that project, Ted. <laughs> All right. Or, uh, no, honey, that dress does not make you look whatever. All right. I already put the check in the mail. How, how often do we... Twist the truth for our own ends. Consider it. What would it be like to live in the light of absolute honesty and truth? Would our lives look different if we did? 
Jesus never exaggerated for the sake of making others think better of him. He never deceived anyone. He never fibbed. He never told a white lie in his entire life. Of course, there is no such thing as that. He never even once bent the truth or spun a tall tale or slandered anyone. And the reason that he didn't is because he is the personification of truth and because all lies are from the devil. As Jesus explained in our text to these unbelieving people, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his character because he's a liar and the father of lies. Let me just say a couple more things. Jesus is the personification of truth. It's important to understand what we're talking about when we say this. The reason that the world does not have clarity about it is because our understanding and experience and perception is so skewed by sin and deceit that when the truth comes, we don't know what to do with him. But Jesus says, he who is of God hears the words of God. He who is of God hears the words of God. Do you hear him as he speaks through his word in the Bible? Do you hear what he's saying to you? Do you just let it go in one ear and right out the other? Is your heart hard like a stone like a, or, or like, a, like a path? Like, like a trodden path where the seed of the word falls on it and Satan comes like a bird and snatches the word right out of your heart before it has any time to germinate and take root. He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason you do not hear them because you are not of God. If there is a person who's not listening to the Lord, Jesus tells us the reason why. This is the, actually the primary weapon that we have in our warfare against the devil. Our primary weapon is not a professional exorcist. I just want to say, after making the film that I did, um, it seems like after the film has come out, there, there's been this incredible influx of these people online, but they have a massive, humongous following. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people are following these guys. They call themselves demon slayers, all right? Demon slayers. This is like a fairly new-ish thing in so-called Christianity where, like, these guys will, will say, uh, if, 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 you, if you are depressed, come and we'll cast out the demon of depression, or if you, if you have a backache, come and we'll cast out the demon of backaches. Or if, you're, if you have um, you know, cancer, we'll cast out the demon of cancer. This is like what they're doing now. This is growing so quickly and so massively, you're going to hear about it. I mean, if you're online, if you're on the internet at all, you maybe already have. Like it's really, really bad, bad theology, bad stuff. Um, and they, they claim that Christians can be possessed by the devil and all kinds of things. But the primary weapon in our warfare against the devil is not a professional exorcist. It's not a series of incantations. It's not the so-called practice of binding and loosing the devil. No, our primary weapon against the devil is the proclamation of the truth. It's the truth. It is reading the truth, imbibing the truth, <clears throat> eating the truth. Jesus says, man does not live on, every, on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The truth. Why? Because the devil is the father of lies. The proclamation of the truth is our weapon against the evil one. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says about the armor of God in Ephesians 6, 10, 10 to 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. 
For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So he says who the enemy is here. How can we possibly fight against that? Here. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may, able to, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then, here it is, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes with the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith, which with you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is it now. Notice there the images of the belt of truth at the beginning, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God at the end of the section. All right? At the very beginning is this belt of truth. At the end is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Capping our weapons against Satan. Here it is. It's the truth, the truth of the gospel. And Jesus Christ, the Holy One, came down out of heaven. And he was born of a virgin. And he lived the perfect life that I could not live, that you could not live. Because we're sinners, we're born sinners. But Christ had no sin. We're born liars, but Christ had no deceit in his mouth. He came into this world, and where Adam, our father Adam, failed, Christ succeeded. He obeyed the Father in every way, in every respect, in every manner. He obeyed the Father. He lived an active life of obedience to God. The act of obedience to Christ. I mean, to, to God the Father. And Christ lived this life, and then at the appointed time, he laid down his life on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins, all of my lies, all of my wrong beliefs, all of my wretchedness and wickedness and sin. He paid it all. He paid the whole penalty with his blood. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. This is the gospel, man, that all who believe in him might have eternal life. That his perfect righteous life, his sinless life, his truth-filled life would be credited to my account. And that my wretched sins would be laid on him at the cross. It is the great exchange my sin for his righteousness, that the only thing that I provide to my salvation is the sin that made it necessary. That's the only thing that I provide. That's it. That's the only thing that you provide. Just the sin that makes salvation necessary. And Christ came into this world and he saved us. Therefore, even though we have this enemy that all the, the Bible says he's really terrifying things about the enemy. He's a roaring lion. That's so terrifying. If there was a big lion that came through that door right now, and we would be like, ah, the lion could just bite our head right off. Right? Easy. Easy. Not even hard work. The lion doesn't break a sweat. But what does Luther say? The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That's it. That's it. Christ, the living word of God. Christ, the Lion of Judah. He fights our battle for us. We don't have to be afraid. We do not tremble at the devil. These are things, the things with which we wage war against him. We proclaim the truth. We believe the truth about Christ. We know that Christ's sheep hear his voice. He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason you do not hear them because you are not of God. If you have not heard the voice of Christ, like that hymn says, I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. Do you hear it? Do you hear him say that to you? If you hear it, come to him and he'll forgive you of everything you've ever done. If you don't hear him say that, 
If you say, I don't care about that. I don't need that. I don't need his grace. That's the sure proof that you don't belong to God. And we do not discriminate in our preaching of this truth. No matter what a person looks like on the outside. No, we preach to all in confidence that the Holy Spirit would apply his sword and his trowel to the hearts of those who hear. May God keep us in the truth. May he guard us from lies and error. May he protect our ear gates and eye gates from the deceptions of Satan, our arch enemy. And may he make us bold witnesses of the truth in a world full of lies. Let's pray. Lord, do that for us, please. Make us your witnesses. Help us to hear the truth, to receive it, to live by it. Though we have an enemy who seeks to destroy us, you are greater than him. And we know his end. We know how it will all end. You have the victory, Lord Jesus. So that no matter what is happening in our world and all the tragedies and terrible things that seem to be taking place all around us, we know that in the end, you have the victory, that you will come back to this world and you will bring your kingdom and all the holy angels with you and you will reign forever and forever. And Lord, we trust in you and we look forward to that day. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to uh, take communion now. If you have in your life heard the voice of Jesus. If you've heard him as he's called you to himself, then take this communion. It represents what Jesus has done for us in the shedding of his blood on the cross, in the body which was pierced for us when he died. Uh, this is what this represents. And and our taking of it is our acknowledgement that outside of what Christ has done for us, we have absolutely no hope whatsoever in the world. But because of Christ, we have a living hope. Um, Richard, I think, are you going to play something? Okay. We'll take it all together. It's amazing that the Apostle Paul writes 1 Corinthians 11 about the Lord's Supper because at one time in his life, his eyes were totally closed. He was totally deceived, uh, self-deceived, and deceived by others, and deceiving others, and he persecuted the church. He hated Jesus, and then Jesus knocked him to the ground and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he looked up and said, Who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, It is I, Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Wow! There's never been more earth-shattering words than those. And Saul got up and was led into Damascus. 
And then a servant of God named Ananias came and laid hands on Paul and prayed. And the scales fell off of his eyes. And he could see. And he was no longer under the devil's delusion. And he lived the most remarkable Christian life of any disciple maybe ever. It is that man who wrote these words. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thank you our gracious Heavenly Father, for delivering us out of our own delusion, showing us the truth about your beloved Son, Jesus. Thank you for drawing us by your sovereign hand into the kingdom of God. Lord, be with us now and help us to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In Jesus' name, amen.